encounters are possible into the place where visitations are possible. We thank you because it is by you that we run through it through and it is by our God that we leap over a wall. We ask so oh God that by your spirit you will speak to us even tonight and cause that the prayers that we will make before this mountain and upon this mountain they will go ahead of us and open everything that has been shut. Thank you, Holy One of Israel. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Please have your seat. God bless you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And I will read from verse 46 of Mark chapter 10. Now, suffice it to say that over the course of the last several weeks, it's been obvious, it's been obvious to us, at least very reasonably so, that there is a direction with which God will have us to travel with regards to our understanding of the concept of scripture and also with regards to our prayers. And the emphasis over the last few weeks have been that of spiritual genealogies. Now, this evening, I want to open to us a perspective of the discourse from Scripture. Because it is not only the case that there are genealogies in the spirit by which a man can gain acts or by which a man's ordination will, f will fall unto him. If you read the story in Luke chapter 15, you will find out, amen, that the prodigal son, uh, he prayed a prayer of, you know, <laughs> made a request, he said, give me the portion of my, of the inheritance that falleth unto me. So there is such a thing that falleth unto you. But by that, it means that there is such a thing that is your portion. There is such a thing that is your inheritance. Are you with me? There is such a thing that falleth unto you. Now, when we look at the concept of spiritual genealogy or spiritual genealogies, it is, the, it is not just such that falleth unto you that is important. In fact, while that is necessary that we strive for that which falleth unto us, and by that I mean to pay attention to what it is that God is doing with you that is sort of like your heritage in the spirit as grounded in scripture. As grounded in scripture. We have that later all through the pages of scripture. We, give me 30 minutes. We have people like Paul in scripture, people like, um, um, what's his name now? Like, like, 
Barnabas, right, there are these kinds of anointings, those kinds of duties or offices, if you like. And God may want to, you know, bring somebody up, particularly as per the thing that he has done with your phobias in, in the past. That is a very important aspect of spiritual genealogies. However, there is more to spiritual genealogies. And on Sunday, we began by looking at something very important. Now, the thing that we began on Sunday, we didn't conclude it. Um, there, were, there was more to it. We felt that or because of the, um, what do you call it, the emphasis that was heavy upon our spirit, upon my spirit, while, while we, we shared on Sunday, I felt it would be proper for us to break a camp at that point and do some praying. And we will pick that up at a later date. But there is an emphasis of spiritual genealogies that I would like for us to look at. And so that sometimes when you come to the place of prayer, for example, when you look at John 1, and in First John, rather, First John chapter 1 and in verse 9, you will see that the scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, right? And to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The interesting thing for me there is that scripture said that he is faithful and just. And if you know anything about justice, when it comes to sins, justice is retributive. Are you getting what I'm saying? You are not getting it. What example do I give to you now? So let's say you broke the laws of the land, right? You broke the laws of the land. And because you broke the laws of the land, you were caught by the law enforcement officer. Whatever the laws of the land at the point is, whoever the law enforcement officer at the moment is. Now, what will be justice with regards to that particular situation? It will not be to forgive your sins. Is that so? Because everybody wants forgiveness of sin until you are on the receiving end of that forgiveness. Well, what I mean by that is, imagine, okay, don't imagine, all right, just think about it, all right, that somebody stole maybe your phone, you know, and if you are such a person who has had his phone stolen in the midst of plenty of people, and then while you lock the door, let nobody go out, let us search. Then successfully you searched, and then you found the phone. Justice would be that your phone is given back to you, right? And the person is made to pay for that action. Now, he has broken the laws of the land. He has stolen. According to the laws of the land, there is supposed to be a punishment for stealing. Now, it cannot therefore be justice for them to say, okay, we have found your phone. Let us forgive him and let him go with the phone. There's nothing just about that. And if everybody says, yes, you know, we need to forgive, and you see him walking out with your phone, there's, a there's going to be a problem. There is nothing just about forgiving of sin, forgiveness of sin, if you look at it from the legal perspective. However, Scripture says that if we confess our sins, God is not faithful and merciful or merciful and generous or flamboyant. He is just. So the question now will be, what is just about the forgiveness of sin? And that is a long discussion on its own. Because if you understand the context of this discussion, you will realize that it will be unjust for God to not forgive the sin of the person who comes confessing it. 
on the strength of what the Son of God has done. Right? Are you with me? On the strength of what the Son of God has done, it will not be just. If a man came confessing his sin and he was denied forgiveness. So, if you want to go the route of forgiveness of sin, there is a passcode with which you will use to gain forgiveness of sin or to obtain forgiveness of sin. That passcode is the blood of Jesus. And that is what it is. Now, with regards, there are other things in scripture that scripture clearly tells us or shows us or reveals to us that things that are within the purview of God, within the control of divine providence or what have you, can be easily accessed by the average person. Even though prior to that time, it was not to be the case. Are you getting what I'm saying? That people should have access to that economy. Because God does not owe anybody anything. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? All right. So, now, I want you to understand this. Because if, it is not, if there is nothing just about the forgiveness of sins, until the sacrifice of Jesus is in the picture, it, however, means that there are other things, or there, if we want to look through scripture, if there are things like this that are not necessarily supposed to be accessible until there is something in place by which that thing can be made accessible, it's going to influence your prayer. Because, properly speaking, properly speaking, the man who prays, or the man who knows the word of God, the man who understands the promises of God in scripture is a man who will have a very robust prayer life. There are certain kinds of prayer that you are not going to pray if your knowledge of the word of God is improved upon. Are you getting what I'm saying? For example, if your knowledge of the word of God is improved upon, you realize that God is not a hired assassin that you cannot employ him to take out your enemies. Are you getting me? I hope you know you cannot employ God to take out your enemies. Just in case you have a beef with somebody and the person um, hurts you really badly, you can't employ God to take out your enemies. Uh, uh, some years ago, I was um, in the compound where I was living. I was still a child then. I remember, I was, I remember the early teens that they were about. There was this neighbor of mine who was praying. She doesn't normally pray. She's the average Nigerian that is a Christian because she's not a Muslim, right? You know that, that kind of a thing, yeah. So she's, she doesn't normally pray. In the morning, the music that comes out of her house is morning devotion music. In the evening when she comes back from work, the music that comes out from her house is that kind of music. <laughs> I can't sing it from here. But you know what I'm talking about. Now, one morning, she prayed. And she prayed so loud that even though you were not in her room, you could hear her pray. It was obvious from the content of her prayer that somebody had offended her. It was obvious that, somebody, that she had a beef with somebody. Even though she did not name the person who it was, but from the content of her prayer, you knew that she, there was somebody is about to die today. Then her, she was now saying to the Lord, let Moto jam them on the road. As they are crossing the highway, let me <laughs> I was a child, but I knew enough to know. Okay, let's, let's, let's imagine that the person on the other end was also praying this prayer. You know, two of them will die that day. And if God was to, were to answer all those enemy prayers, if it was that easy, the witch will employ it. Are you getting what I'm saying? She will not need to do witchcraft. 
All she will need to do is say, God, take out this person and her children. But you want to find out, if you want to, if you want to get something from God, is there, a, is there something that God has put in place by which this thing can be accessed? That's one of, one of the things you want to find out. And so let's look at scripture. In Mark chapter 10, I, I will read from verse 46. Now, there is an interesting story here that I think um, would lay the foundation for what I want us to do tonight. So we're still, we're still doing genealogies. And, there, they, and they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he called thee. And he, and he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do? unto thee. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now, if we are going to, uh, one, of the, one of the things I want us to do this evening is to look at this situation and probe it biblically as it is presented unto us. Then we will see how to get um, hold on this prayer. There is such a thing that is called the mercy of God. And mercy is actually a very prominent theme in both covenants, both in the old covenant and in the new covenant. Mercy is a very prominent theme. You, don't, you find mercy in the old covenant, you find mercy in the new covenant. And one of the things that a believer should not desire to outgrow. Are you getting what I'm saying? Let me say this, because the other day, which was, somebody put it, put it on her WhatsApp status, and I happened to see it. Now, you need to know your place in Christ, right? Stop begging God. You need to know your place in Christ. That, don't be a beggar. Stop begging God. <laughs> okay. So what do we do? They say you should ask. Claim what is yours in God. And girls, claim it. I shouldn't beg God. <laughs> it is God though, that we are talking about God. Any knowledge that makes you lose reverence for God eh, is a demonic knowledge. If you check scripture, you will find out that the closer people went to God, 
the more reverential they were. The, the more people knew God, the more reverence they had for him, the more fear they had for him. Any knowledge that makes you take God as your paddy, <laughs> it is of devils. It is not sponsored by God. Okay. Jesus Christ himself, that is the son of God. Do you know his posture before God? In John chapter, is it John chapter 19 now? When Jesus was burdened and he went to Gethsemane to pray, right? The Bible tells us he fell on his face. This was before the Lord, before God. In the presence of God. Jesus did not, he never demanded of God. He never demanded of God that, my guy, you day, we need to, <laughs> it never happened. When you go to the book of Revelation, Jesus is described as the lamb, the lamb of God. Are you with me? Before God, he is his lamb. Okay. Any knowledge that makes you lose reverence for God is demonic. Beg God, oh. I am begging you on your behalf. It will beg God. And, and when you see people telling you things that are making you look like, you know what, what it happens when people be shouting, Whoo, he, that thing is his flesh that is gaining ventilation. Are you getting what I'm saying? That knowledge that makes you feel like you go out now and you call God for a, a business meeting. Beg him. The Bible says, God, the subscription of mercy on a daily basis eh, is renewed. That means you cannot live on yesterday's mercy. The fact that they showed you mercy yesterday does not mean that you can bank on it. You need to ask for it every day. In any case, let's look at the scripture. So the Bible tells us that, uh, that they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, he came out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great number of people. A certain man, whose name was Blind Bartimaeus. Now, they, you, you need to understand that Whatever this man's name was, at birth. Because usually, when a child is born, you do not know on the day the child is born that the child is blind. Are you getting what I'm saying? It takes time. Sometimes it will take a few months. When you know, people realize that ah, this child's eye is not following light, so that's when they, they now find, ah, he, he is blind. So this man had a name that was given to him at his naming ceremony. But that name now was completely inconsequential. Nobody knew what the name was. Nobody remembered what the name was. All he was called by was his condition. He was called Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. And that Bartimaeus was the son of Timaeus. You know, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, you would see something like, Simon Bar Jonah. That Bar Jonah is the son of Jonah. So Bartimaeus was simply the son of Timaeus. Whatever his name was, um, was not something that the people of his day knew. All they knew him as was blind Bartimaeus. Okay, so on this day, the Bible tells us that while Jesus came out of Jericho and a crowd was following him, this man sat by the highway, he sat by the wayside, and he was begging for arms. His condition had made him incapacitated, and there was very little assistance for people who were visually impaired in that day. 
So whatever it was that he could get, whatever it was that he could get, um, would be based on the benevolence of people to him. But what, it is, what is interesting to me about this man was how solid um, this man was in his knowledge of the scriptures. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, you need to understand the, the culture that this man grew up in. You, you need to understand the culture that this man grew up in. On this day, the man knew enough to know. Because, you see, if Jesus was passing, he wasn't doing a one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling session. That he will come to people one after the other and say, okay, what's your prayer? They, Jesus would have to be at a hearing distance from the guy. For the guy to be able, for Jesus to be able to hear the thing that the man is saying, number one. Number two, take account of the fact that there was a multitude. Are you getting what I'm saying? And this multitude were not silently walking by. If a multitude is around, it means that there's going to be a lot of sound, a lot of noise around the place where this multitude is. So, regardless of the fact, or the, the, there was a, a, the first, what do you call it, um, difficulty or limitation that this man would have would be the fact that he could not see. Number two, it could be the fact that, it would be the fact that he did not have time with Jesus. That Jesus will be moving. And so if his prayer will catch the attention of Jesus, Jesus would have to be at a hearing distance from him. And his voice would have to trump the voice of all the people that will be around Jesus at the time. Follow me. So, the next verse, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. So this man was a person who was located at this highway, begging. Now, he had no idea who will pass by on this day. He did not know that Jesus will come passing. So he couldn't have prepared a prayer point. It was while Jesus was there that he knew that Jesus was there. I am saying that this man had a solid, solid understanding of the scriptures. So that when he had the opportunity to pray, he knew what to pray. When he had the opportunity to, to appeal, to beg, he knew what to say. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him. So he began to shout. He began to shout. He, he, he shouted so loud. The word cry there is the word shout, right? He shouted so loud that his voice began to cause distraction. You know what I'm talking about? How people, who, a person will be in a crowd and he makes his voice very, very obvious such that you cannot deny the fact that this person is wanting to be heard. Now, people now began to silence him. All right? And many charged him that he should hold his peace. So they began to silence him. They began to silence him, but he now increased his intensity. Now, let me veer off to say something. That oftentimes, there are these people. When it comes to matters of destiny, and of course, you know the story of Bartimaeus already. So, um, the point will be clear to you um, by now. By now. But when it comes to matters of destiny, nobody, you are not supposed to be ignorant of the thing that is doing you. People external to you 
should not be more concerned about what is doing you than you yourself. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because people, we, we can be a very unserious group of people. There are some people that you look at their life and they are so unaware. The level of their self-awareness is so, so infinitesimal that it seems to be. So they, every time they come to you, they're like, please pray for me, please pray for me, please pray for me. When you begin to probe their own life and you want to find out what is the commitment. And let me tell you the truth. The reason why your life is the way it is, where you are taking things the way you are taking it, is because something never do you yet. That's why you are just normal. There is a kind of burden, and by burden, I do not mean burden that comes from heaven. There's a kind of situation that you will find yourself in that you will be unable to sleep. Are you getting what I'm saying? And this sleep is not because if you close your eyes, you will not sleep. It is actually because you know that sleeping is counterproductive at this time. Uh, have, you, have, you not started, have you started fasting that you do not know when it will end? Your own is that, have you, have you done it before? Your own is that it is until this matter is solved. God knows that I won't stop. People should not be more self-aware of what is doing you than you are. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because, the reason is because, by the time your cries, your shoutings, your prayers, begin to cause irritation. And this irritation can be twofold. It could either be irritation because of the effect of your prayers on the people, the inconveniences that is given to them, or out of pity. That, ah. Then these people will come and say, hold your peace. And le- listen to me, properly speaking. Properly speaking. I should only hold my peace when I have peace. If I don't have peace, there is nothing to hold. Isn't it? <laughs> these people that are saying, hold your peace, it is not because they love you so very much. It's not. They are asking you to hold your peace to calm you down because your engagement is causing irritation to their own activity. And I know what I'm talking about. Listen to me. If you have not cried enough, and by cry now, the context I'm using it now is, is prayer. Because some of us are very emotional. Anything can make you cry. You can even be reading how they are dragging somebody on Twitter and you begin to cry. That's not what I'm describing at all. Right? If you have not cried enough that your cry begins to attract the attention of people that are around your space and there is a legitimate infirmity in your own existence. It means you are not yet serious. And that seriousness, that seriousness often could be a sign of ignorance. Because the truth is this. There is, there is only how far you can engage. If your knowledge base is shallow, are you with me? I showed you the other day. Let the high praises of God be upon um, my lips and a two-edged sword in my hand, right? And the reason is so that I can execute the judgment that is written. So the meaning of that is that if the judgment, if the judgment that has been written is not obvious to me, if I do not know it, I cannot strive towards execute it. Are you get what I'm saying? Do you know that there is how you can be, you can adjust to an infirmity so much so that it becomes normal to you? In fact, that infirmity can actually be the, way, the reason why people are having mercy on you. 
Are you getting me? So he said, ah, he's blind. Then you don't give him money. If you were not blind, nobody would look in your direction. He said, can I go and walk? Don't be lazy. Now, there is how you can adjust to blindness or an infirmity. You now start doing support group. You know that support group thing? You now look for people that share the same infirmity with you. You form a community. You people become like people supporting people. That kind of thing. That, that, that kind of situation. Uh-huh. So that you are now completely unaware of the gravity of the situation in which you have found yourself. That's a very valid possibility. What will make a person to insist, right, in the place of prayer is what he knows about what his life should normally be regularly. And I'm coming to something in what I'm, with what I'm doing. Okay. So, if you, there is an infirmity in your life and you have not cried enough to attract the attention of people. Don't forget, your intention is not to attract people's attention. There are certain issues that when they rise up, when you talk about it to God, they go. There are others that they are not like that. You will do all kinds of things. You do all kinds of assets. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or am I the only one with problems? That, you know, you do the morning, you know the, you do the morning prayer and fasting. The one that you pray in the morning, you fast in the morning, and then you break at night. You do it for like 35 days, 45 days. It doesn't work. Maybe, let me do the night one. You now switch from the morning prayer to the night prayer. To the, to the night prayer and fasting. You do that one for like 52 days. <laughs> the thing doesn't change. You say, okay. Let me do the morning and the night together. You do that one like three days. So what is it? What is the, what is the situation? Do you know what, exactly what I'm talking about? That those things that are, they are, they are stubborn. Like, like ailments that are resistant to medication. Exactly. Now, your crying should be able to gain the attention of these guys that are around you, even though your intention is not to gain the attention. Your intention is to gain the attention of the one to whom you are calling. But I'm saying that when you gain their attention, they will not follow you and pray and say, have mercy on him. That's not, that, that's not their intention. Their intention is to silence you. And the, you see, there are many ways, hi, there are many ways in which they will do the silencing. There are so many people that are coming to encourage you. They are coming to, um, to identify with you in that situation that what they are actually doing is silencing you. However, no matter the solidarity that people show you, because you know that there is how something will do you, like you are afflicted with something, and then people now rally around you, you enjoy their presence so much, and you feel like it is good for us to be here. Are you getting what I'm saying? Great. The Bible says, and many charged him. It could be the case that everywhere you turn, everywhere you go, there are these many that will keep charging you and say, sir, this is your prayer. And let me tell you something. When you need something from God, there is no need to gather composure. The other day, uh, maybe some of you had seen that video. I was talking to my brother about um, the thing. Um, so there's this guy that has been doing some funny moves. His intention is to ask God for power. Right? But when he wants to ask God for power, how we know that he's asking for power is that he will put it online. God, give me power. You write it as a post. Give me power. Oh, let me burn for, for you in my world. That's, that's prayer. Then there is this other guy that we saw this, this video. He was praying for power and he was doing much past. That he became... You know how somebody will pray and you are like, is this, <laughs> is this one prayer too? Because of the way he's invested in the issue. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, you see, when you come to the place of prayer between you and God, there are certain issues that your composure eh, before the Lord should 
not be your, your should not be paramount in your experience. That it is not that I I don't need no. When you come before the Lord, the way to do it is to cry out loud before the Lord. If I am praying where people are, I want to adjust my tie and make sure that the flow is because there is how you be leading prayer if you are leading prayer. And if you pray in a certain way, people will leave the prayer they are praying and watch you. And like, this is interesting. And you don't want to do that in public. But when it is between you and God alone, it is only you and God. That is why it is funny to me and really disgusting. How do people go to personal places of prayer and they set up a camera? It is just them and God. They went to pray, then they set up a camera and record it and make content out of a personal time they had with the Lord. It's obvious to you who the audience was. Right? Okay. Now, these people, these men will come and their intention is to charge. You know, you know what the charge is? It's to charge. You no, know, we talk about like a prayer charge or come and take a charge. It is to motivate you. And meanwhile, this motivation they were giving to him was to discourage him from praying. Friends, I need you to understand, and, and, and I don't have the time because I'm running for it. I need you to understand that every time you hear a sermon, every time you hear a motivation, and that motivation, rather than encouraging prayer, is trying to, to um, discourage you from making prayers because there are those kinds of things all over the place. Sometimes they are so subtle that they can be missed. But when you listen to those charges, you will think that there is a way to achieve things of the spirit in the flesh. That, that is the hold your peace charge. That we are raising a generation of people and they think it's only by prayer, it's only by prayer, it's only by prayer. Okay. When people say it is not only by prayer, the easy response is, let me pray first and find out. Isn't it? Eh, let me pray first. Let me pray first and let me find out that it is not only by prayer. Then I can agree with you. Because oftentimes, oftentimes, it is the wisdom of the serpent. Where, now, you know how the story ended. So you know that Jesus was within a, a, an, an, an earshot from him. His deliverance that day was going to be um, dependent on what the Lord will do for him. Yet, there were people around him who were discouraging him from crying. His response was that he cried the more a great deal. He increased his prayer. He, just in case what I have been doing was irritating you, get ready for further irritation. He cried the more a great deal. Uh, and friends, let the people of the world eh, give up on you. Let them give up. I want you to hold God to the point that the people of the world, right, will give up on you. Okay? He cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, my question is, what is it about this his prayer that made the Lord to be stopped in his tracks. Because verse 49 tells us, and Jesus stood still. What is it about this his prayer that made the Lord to be stopped in his tracks? Now, in Isaiah chapter 55, um, in Isaiah chapter 55, beginning from verse 1. Let's quickly run to that passage of scripture. Isaiah 55, beginning from verse 1. Ho, oh, everyone that trusted, come ye to the waters, and he that had no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come and buy. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfied not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. 
And what is the everlasting covenant? Even they show mercies of David. Hmm. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even they show mercies of David. All right. In Psalms 18 and in verse 50. Psalms 18 and in verse 50. It says, great deliverance given he to his king, and he shows mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed, how? Forevermore. Now, this gives you the, the, the quality of the intervention that God gave to Moses, to David rather. It was not a momentary um, mercy. It was an everlasting mercy, all right? So that you find out that the way that the throne was transferred from Saul onto David in his day was by mercy. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 33, in Jeremiah chapter 33, somewhere around verse 15, Jeremiah chapter 33 and in verse 15, um, it says, in those days, at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord, our righteousness. For thus said the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. The way that the kingdom was transferred from Saul unto David was by mercy. The way that it stayed, and the, the, the description is a very long one. You realize that in Genesis 49, the thing that um, Jacob said unto Judah was that the scepter, shall not depart from Judah, nor the Lord give her from where? Between his feet. Until Shiloh comes. And Shiloh, in prophecy, was referring to the Lord, to Christ. Until the Messiah comes, right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Nor the Lord give her from between his feet. Until Shiloh comes. And unto him shall the garden of his people be. And there are two dimensions of that prophecy. There is the already not yet dimension of that prophecy, which would manifest in Judah as per the tribe. Are you with me? Alright? That would manifest in Judah as per the tribe. There is the already not yet dimension. There is now the prophetic one, which will ultimately be fulfilled in Christ. So when Jacob was saying that the scepter, it was the scepter of rulership, you know, scepter, the symbol of authority will not depart from Judah. So it seems to assume that at the time it was with Judah. Seems to assume. Because in is it first Chronicles chapter 5 and in verse 1. Let me see that scripture. I think it should be first Chronicles chapter 5. In first Chronicles chapter 5 and in verse 1, um, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defied his father's birth, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the what? The birthright. Verse 2. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came what? So how did the scepter get to Judah? He prevailed. So if you realize, if you go to the book of Revelation, when John saw that vision, where they said, who is worthy to unpack the seal? And then he began to weep because none was worthy to, un to unlock the seal. One of the elders said unto him, weep not for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has what? Prevailed. Aha. The root of David had prevailed. Had prevailed. So that was the prophetic declaration. The way that the chief ruler came from Judah was that he what? 
he prevailed. Hi, and I don't have the time to, to flesh that out for you. But listen to me. So the prophecy was that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the Lord giver from between his feet. Meanwhile, it was also captured in the ordinances of God that a bastard shall not come into the congregation of the Lord for a period of 10 generations. So if a bastard was to be found, that bastard will not come into the congregation of the Lord. His children will not come into the congregation of the Lord. His children's children will not come into the congregation of the Lord until the 10th generation, right? And if you go to um, um, Genesis 38, you would remember, you remember the story of how Judah went in on Totama. Remember the story? That he had, he had three sons, eh, Onan and, um, and Shelah. So the first one died, then the second one died, and with all the, the, the circumstances that surrounded it. Now, when Judah found out that his children were dying like that, he decided to play smart. And he told the lady, go and, go and wait. One day, Judah himself, Judah himself, went on a trip. And the traveler visited him. Well, you, you, know, you know the traveler? <laughs> he went and found a lady who was clothed in the attire of a harlot. That's what Genesis 38 says. It means that there is a way that harlots dress. Are you with me? You see, the, there was a Tama in Genesis. There was another Tama somewhere in Second Samuel. That one that was the daughter of David. You remember that Tama? Even that Tama too was known by the way she dressed. You, you, you remember how she dressed? She dressed with the attire that the virgin daughters of the king wore. So that when you saw her, you knew that this lady was a king's daughter. Not just was she a king's daughter, she was also the virgin, a virgin daughter of the king. So that when Ammon defiled her, she tore her garment. I'm saying that there is a way that the daughters of kings dress. There is a way that her lords dress. There is a way. There is a way. The, the, the child of God, the daughter of God, is not to freestyle in her dressing. In fact, it was so important, it was so important that at, in Genesis, after God had finished sharing the punishments to Adam, to Eve, he made dresses for them. After then, the next time we see God making dresses for people is when he's bringing them into priesthood. Are you with me? Later on, right in the book of Revelation, you also see that God is giving people dresses. Listen to me. Listen to me. God takes your dressing seriously. Don't just say you are dressed as you like. Crazy. What? Do you know what God is doing in my heart? There is nothing going on in your heart if you are not seeing it outside. There is nothing. You cannot be wearing handkerchief and you are saying that what is going on in my heart is, is, is deep. God is, you know, it doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. When Judah went in onto Tamar, we saw that Tamar got pregnant, you know, and then she gave birth to two boys. Right? Zerah and Phares. Now, it was from that his lineage that David was supposed to come, come through later on. But then you will find out that because a bastard shall not come into the congregation of the Lord, it seems to me that God was keeping Judah in waiting until 10 generations will pass, right? Before the scepter will be handed over to his hand. Are you getting what I'm saying at all? It, because you now see that all kinds of people will be brought into the picture from prophets to judges until, you, until David was ready. And of course, you see that there was a soul that came in, which was not really what the Lord wanted at the time. But then... When David came to the picture, God now established an everlasting covenant with him and said to him, as we saw in Jeremiah 33, that as long as the earth remains, Jeremiah 33, give me that scripture again. Jeremiah 33, verse 17. Jeremiah 33, verse 17. For thus said the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. So, even when Rehoboam 
Remember Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Even when the, the nation of Israel revolted by an act of God's mercy, God kept for him a portion of the kingdom because of mercy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now you want to find out what is it about David that made God show mercy on him? What, what is it about him? Because if you look at the evidence in scripture, you will be pretty surprised that God waited 10 generations because there was a bastard at the beginning only to hand over to a bastard at the end of the day. Because that was who David was. Are, are you getting what I'm saying? That was who David was. And you're like, what exactly is going on here? Well, um, somewhere in... Is it 2 Chronicles now, chapter 13? 2 Chronicles chapter 13 and in verse 5. Let's see what that says. 2 Chronicles chapter 13 and in verse 5. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel, what did he do? Gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever. Even to him and to his sons by a covenant of what? Of salt. And the covenant of salt talked about the covenant of longevity. Because salt is used for preservation. It's a covenant of longevity. It's an everlasting one. So, in fact, when you, look, when you look at David, you will find out that later on, as scripture progressed, the house of Jesse was later on called the house of David. Because the Bible said that there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. The, the house of David waxed stronger and stronger. Then you now want to find out what is it about this house that it is now called the house of David. This was a man that when Samuel showed up in the territory of his dad and said, sanctify yourselves, they gathered all he... Jesse gathered all his sons and forgot about David in the forest. He didn't say, I have one more. Until he was asked. Are you getting what I'm saying? He tells you about his placement. In fact, if you look at the, 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 the evidence, you will find out that the mother of David was not the same with the mother of the other children of Jesse. So, somewhat, he was a child that was born out of due season, all right? Now, this is the person that from being forgotten in the backsides of the wilderness, he is being brought and the house is called his house. It is called his house. There was, no, there was nothing in David that qualified him for that kind of show of benevolence except that as God revealed it to us, God had mercy on David. When the, the angel was coming to his mother, to the mother of Jesus, in Matthew chapter 2, right? Matthew chapter 2, or Luke chapter 2, there about. He said unto him that the Lord God will give him the throne, the kingdom of his father, David. Okay. Okay. So, it's against this backdrop that we see that simply because it had been captured in prophecy all the way in Genesis 49. That the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And the person to whom God chose to ground, to immortalize this prophecy in was David. The fulfillment of the prophecy was Christ, was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who is called the son of David. God chose to immortalize because there was a long line of succession between Judah and Jesus. Are you with me? There was a long line of succession between Judah and Jesus. Yet by the act of the mercies of God, God chose David to embody this prophecy that he will later fulfill in Christ. And we don't get to see 
that this act, this choice, this, this uh, preordination was an act of the mercy of God. Bartimaeus was a student of the scripture so that when he knew that the only way he could break into light on this day eh, was to make demand on the portal by which mercies could be made sure. They show mercies. You see, there is a portal by which if you act, if you go by it, God will not refuse you. The two times in scripture that we see people use son of David to secure mercy, he didn't turn them back. The first time it was that Canaanite woman. That Canaanite woman, and when even when Jesus was, was giving her the excuse that you are not of the seed of Abraham, right? She said that even the dogs, yes, they are qualified to eat of the crumbs that fall from the table. Jesus looked upon her and had mercy upon her. I am saying there is a portal by which the activities of God can be tracked, can be traced. And when we come to mercy, what we see or who we see is that in the way that when God was to embody a certain reality in Elijah, so much so that when John the Baptist was to come later on, the person that wore this toga sufficiently in its full expression, right, was Elijah. That God will refer to Elijah and say, Elijah, I will send Elijah. In the same way, in the activities of God, there are figures like that in scripture by whom God has invested his divinity. When it comes to mercy, the template for how God can show mercy to man eh, is David. Such that when a man called Bartimaeus would years later, centuries later, want to lay claim on mercy, the way that he would gain access to that, that, um, that gate is by David, son of David. Have mercy on me. Listen to me. There is nothing that you want God to do for you that God has not done to somebody before or done for somebody before. Are you getting what I'm saying? Oh, there is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing. If you are a couple that is expecting God for the fruit of the womb, you are expecting God for a child. If you are expecting God for a supernatural healing, if you are expecting a, um, what do you call it? Um, supplies, material supplies. You want a breakthrough in your business. You want, there is a template in scripture. There is somebody in scripture that God has done it for. When James was telling us that who so lacketh wisdom, let him ask of the Lord. You see, if you are such a person that you realize that your infirmity is that you lack wisdom, there is a way to get it. Eh? God has given wisdom to people in scripture before. If you are in government, you are in the secular world, there are people in scripture that were they that are a model of how God can help a man even in that sector. I am saying that spiritual genealogies are, can also be employed to access the activities of God. The way that he did things to people. God is consistent in his character. He doesn't change. He's consistent. He doesn't change. And so we can trust him in the same way that we can say that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. In the same way, we can be certain that if we walk through the path that he charted for us through his dealings with people prior to us, the only problem is that many of us do not know, we are not conversant with the counsel of God as we read in scripture enough to make our prayers have a punch. We are not. 
We just think that we can whip up sentiments when it comes to God. I am saying that God is faithful and just. Are you getting what I'm saying? God is faithful and just. He is faithful and just. If it is mercy that you want to access from God, there is a portal. There is a template by which God has shown mercy to people. If it is wisdom you want to access from God, there is a template. If it is encounters, there is a template. There are templates in scripture by which God has done. And you see, you see, it is important that you first ground yourself in the things that God has done to people in scripture before you start seeking novel encounters. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because some of you want to ride on horses in the sky. You want to see yourself flying with Leviathan across the sky. Then you know that, ah, I have arrived. Before you start going, the, and I'm not saying that God cannot put you on a horse through the sky. I'm only saying that before you begin to search for things that people have not seen, you want to be conversant eh, around the corridors by which other people in scripture have, have walked. There is how to look at your life and you know that what is lacking in this life is wisdom. I, I don't have it. I don't have it. What, what I am lacking now like this is I no get sense. And you know there are times that you, you go to God like this and say, God, see, I no get sense. I, I, many times I have tried to employ my intellectual prowess to this thing. Every time I did, I goofed. They paid me small money in the office. I now saw a, an investment portal. I invested. Then my hundred thousand became two five. It is because I know get sense. You, you know. But the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. See, He leads me. He leads me. It is because you are my shepherd, I am coming to you for supplies. I don't get sense. I don't know if you are sincere when you speak to the Lord. But I'm saying that if you can go to scripture, and you will find out that there are people that God has dealt with in a good way. He has dealt with them. You can now be able to situate your life in those experiences. The prayer I want us to pray tonight. Before we pray that prayer, I want to ask you a question. Do you know enough to pray? Do you know? Are you self-aware sufficiently of the things that are plaguing you? If you have identified it, I hope, because for some of us, it is even the case, that our parents are more interested in our lives than we are. And I know that there is how that their interest could border around ignorance and fear and all kinds of things. So, ah, she's 37, she has not married. And it can even be the case that that is them being apprehensive. But you see a person who is completely unaware. He has no idea of what is going on in his life. So much so that he has nothing deep going on between him and God. It is the people that are looking out to him and are telling him, cry now. In Bartimaeus case, it was that they said, don't cry. In your case, they are saying, won't you cry? Cry now. If that is your experience, it is a bad day. It's a bad day. And just in case you have begun to cry, and people are coming to counsel you and say, see, this thing that you are doing, we have done it though. It is not by this thing. So you have done it. And it is not by it. Let me do it too. Let me find out. You cannot get wrong in seeking God. Are you getting what I'm saying? You can't get wrong. And the, the way the spirit realm is, is designed, it is designed in such a way that there is no formula to it. There's no formula to it. So you cannot go and meet somebody and the person say, this is how I do it. And you do it and it will come out for you. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new species. He's a new creation. There is something new that God is doing in your life. Are you getting what I'm saying? 
So, you should not be completely unaware of what is going on with you. Then, you should be able to trace this intervention that you are seeking. What is the history of this activity of God across the history of man? What is the what is the what is it? What is what is it? This thing that God is doing, or this thing I'm asking, asking God to, God to do. What is the genealogy across the history of man? That way, you can be sure if God has, if God has brought fire from heaven before, right? It means He can do it again. In 2 Kings chapter 2, when Elijah and Elisha were journeying from Gilgal onto Jordan, the place where God will take Elijah up, there was a water body that separated them. That water body was the river Jordan. You remember the story? Elijah took his mantle and he divided the water. The water parted hither and thither. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting to me. It's really interesting to me. That God, you know that Jordan was the same Jordan that God dried up for the people of Israel. You remember? When the children of Israel, that was the separation between the, the wilderness and the promised land for them. God dried up the Jordan on their account. You remember the story? Now, there were two men here. This was not a nation. Two men stood before the Jordan. Two men. And God divided the Jordan on the account of two men. Two men. I would have thought that, you know how you will go to a place, a business center. And you say, ah, this thing that you want to do now. It is the small gen that will do it. So they put on the small gen for you. There's the one that the big gen will do. There are certain things that, for example, for example, there are certain things that, even if it is for one person that you are going to do it, that machine, it's only the big gen that can power it. You understand what I'm saying? Whether there are 10 people, whether there are 100, whether it is one, it's only the big gen that can power it. And sometimes some business owners will say, eh, I cannot put on the gen for just one person. God will, sup, will, will supply the, uh, the, the economy of heaven eh, to divide the Jordan for a nation. That's like a big gen. They say, okay, it's, a nation wants to pass. So say, yeah, on the big gen. Now, two people are standing before the Jordan. And the same gen, you, so you get the, the idea of gen I'm talking about, God will employ it to divide the Jordan for two people. It gets better. Because when Elisha was coming back, he was alone. <laughs> he was alone. And the Bible said, no, take me to where Elijah was. Elisha was coming back. When Elisha was coming back, he picked up the mantle and he struck the water. The water did not respond. He now said, where is the Lord God of who? Elijah. This is what I am showing to you. That there are certain things in the spirit that if you want to access them, all you need to do is to find out where has God done this for somebody before? Has he, has he done it before? If he has done it before, he will do it again. That was what Bartimaeus was doing. You showed mercy unto David, son of David. David, he got the memo. You, you showed mercy unto David, have mercy on me. So, Tibaios, Tibaios knew the trajectory that if you want to access mercy, David is, is the potter. Elisha stood before this water body and said, Ah, own the gen for me. Do you know what kind of temerity? You, you, you know the temerity that it will take for a man. The history that they had at the time was that God divided this Jordan for a nation. What you did, what you employed for one nation, I want you to employ it for me. Uh, what is giving me
me that bonus. Just a few hours ago, I saw you do it for Elijah. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And immediately, and when he had smitten the waters, they parted Hita and Tita. And Elisha went to her. The activities of God are not scarce. All he needs are men that will make demand on heaven. That see, we have studied your move across the history of man. We know the things that you are capable of doing because you have done it before. It is on the strength of these things that we make demand on you. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. Even though it, there is nothing just about forgiving sins. But on the strength of the sacrifice of Jesus, God cannot not forgive your sin. So that we can now come and on the strength of the mercy that he showed unto a man like David, we can ask for mercy. On the strength of the wonders he showed to Elijah when he parted the waters before him and he could cross through, Elijah could come on the strength of that same experience and make demand on God. That's what I want you to do tonight. But tonight, I don't know what it is. Are you aware of what is going on in your life? Has God done it for somebody before? Can you find it in scripture? That these are the activities of God. He said, say unto God, how terrible are thou in your ways. Through the greatness of your power shall your enemies submit themselves unto you. He says, as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The kings of the world shall fade away and they shall be afraid out of their close places. There is something that you have done for people before me. It is on the strength of those experiences that I come. Can we make that a prayer? I leva sabro ke ni la basa i lebron de basamba. Sky be brentos ke biva lambre sabam be fe kabona saila. Ros ke be file brontos ke ve pre kai le ventos. Bras evento pre ke vila. Ros ke pila bras kabo ve brente sabala ve lendos. Rokere se brente se be ve lomba. A kaile bro se fembo rasambe lambo. Kaile samba rahailos. 